back, everybody. We have our speaker, our guest speaker here, uh, Matt Williams. And uh, I, I met Matt through a, uh, a program I'm a member of, and, and I highly recommend others to, to join this. Uh, it's called Abundance Digital Crowd. And, you know, you turn on the news, and it's, <laughs> as Peter Demandis likes to say, it's, CNN is like the constantly negative news, or the crisis news network. And it's just bad story after bad story, and it kind of plays on a trick on our brain that we need to process bad news first, especially when we were living in the jungles, you know. And, and if you missed out on some good news, you might miss a meal. But if you missed out on some bad news, that yeah, could be the end of your gene pool. But now advertisers want to get more people and the, these news networks want to get more people. So they promote bad news. But th there's a lot of good news out there. It's a lot of good news. So um, I want to just uh, get back to something we did in our introduction and make sure you understand that we need to know about Moore's Law for the class and how processing speed doubles on a, on a silicon wafer. That's not the first time that happened. We've had this happening in, in um, uh, processing since we've been doing things on vacuum tubes and uh, magnetic relay switches. So if you've read that Moore's Law is slowing down, that's true. Uh, but something else is going to happen. We're, 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 we're uh, constantly pushing that thing. And Ray Kurzweil um, wrote a book called The Singularity is Near, where we looked at, you know, as we develop artificial intelligence, they're going to get to some type of human type of uh, reasoning skills um, soon in the next 10 years or so and, and his prediction is 2029 uh some people think it's sooner in, in specialized ai we've certainly seen that uh, uh ais can be much better chess players than we are but generalized ai is when when the ai could do everything we can do and and 2029 may be that time and kurzweil has been amazing at his predictions uh and by 2045 a point that he calls the singularity when uh, an AI and and this isn't like one you know government run machine that we all bow down to this is what right now is in your phone which may be uh, a chip that you swallow or an earring or something in your glasses however you want to put it on uh, but by 2045 this thing Siri Alexa whatever will be smarter than all humans put together this is uh, I, I said you know when you think of any problem we have in the universe or in the world any problem you have what if somebody twice as smart as you is working on it? What if somebody four times? What if somebody a thousand times, a million times smarter than you? You know, humans are the most dominating species on the planet. It's not because we're bigger or stronger or faster. It's not because we have sharper teeth. It's because we're smarter. So uh, I, I've, I'm an old Star Trek fan. I love it when they would run into AIs or whatever. But... Um, we, we have people who uh, I like to categorize the, the opinions of, of AI takeovers or AI acceleration, super intelligence, in four basic categories. You have the doubters, the people who say, no, that could never happen. Uh, you have the utopians, uh, which I mostly am. I, I really think that we're going to solve a lot of problems this way. You know, uh, I, I just have a lot of hope. But we also have the dystopians, the, the, uh, the Terminator scenario, that they're not even going to need us, man. They're going to kill us off. But I think actually most of us really fall into uninformed. There's a lot to be learned here. We don't know what's going on. So we're going to see as it unfolds. But I'm personally very optimistic. Um, so I, I mentioned uh, that I, I, I uh, met Matt through a, a forum called Abundance Digital. And that's created by Peter Diamandis, who is... Uh, a lot of things. He's, he's done a lot of amazing things, including being Ray Kurzweil's uh, partner in starting uh, Singularity University. But uh, I watched Peter talk last uh, January at TED Talk, on, uh, and, and he spoke of some, my three favorite subjects. Uh, that is space development, and he is the uh, one of the uh, owners of. Um, was well, started the X Prize, but also a company called uh, Planetary Resources, where they're mining asteroids or hoping to mine asteroids. Uh, he talked about intelligence increase, exponential growth of intelligence, and life extension. Three yeah, very convergent technologies that are going to lead to me a wonderful world. So the people in Peter's group, we don't look at those crisis news networks. We we look at news and we try to extract the good things and. There's stories in here, and I highly recommend people join this group, uh, whether it's 3D printing or, or uh, health sciences, uh, quantum uh, computing, uh, all kinds of wonderful, wonderful things that the world is going toward, and it's just great, great stuff. So uh, I met Matt. Matt seems to have a lot of experience in various fields, and um, 
one of his, his strengths is artificial intelligence, which we need to know some basic level stuff for our test. I would expect, um, you know, I, I said there's generalized versus specialized. Well, another way of looking at AI is, is it um, an expert system, meaning I have to train it. And tomorrow when we go into our official curriculum, we'll see how I trained a uh, optical character recognition system. This is a letter A, and then this is a letter A. And this font is different, but it's still a letter A. And eventually learns the rules and within a limited domain of font types, you can scan in a document and start figuring out what it is. But we have neural networks that are for years uh, were, were theoretical in my experience, uh, but now they really work where they train themselves. So Alpha Ago trained itself on how to play Atari video games. And the, um, the rule, this only the last couple of years, they said, see the score at the top? Your job is to figure out how to maximize it. And it started, I thought this was pretty neat, you know, the people who write the games, they're not necessarily the best players. So if anybody remembers the old game Breakout, it figured out a way to beat breakout that the programmers never considered. So that's what you need to know. And that they'll call that neural networking. Some people call that deep learning. Uh, so that's basically what we need to know for the test, but there's a lot going on in AI. So without any further ado, uh, Matt, uh, thank you very, very much for joining us today. And uh, please say hi, introduce yourself and let's hear what you got. And I'll stop sharing my screen here. Great. Hi, uh, my name again is Matthew Williams. Um, as Larry mentioned, we met on the Abundance Digital Forum, which uh, for those who haven't heard of it, it's a fantastic place. Um, one of the great things about ideas and information is that if you have two people talking and they each bring an idea to the table, not only do they both leave with an additional idea, they actually oftentimes come with a brand new idea. So forums for discussion on things like artificial intelligence, quantum computing, and things that, as Larry mentioned, we really don't know a lot about yet. Um, that allows us to not only discuss these things, but to kind of plan the trajectory for the future. And that's a lot of what my talk is about. Uh, artificial intelligence, as Larry mentioned, is uh, a thing that's becoming very popular right now. It's in the news all the time. But one of the biggest problems really is that there's a lot of confusion around it. And so I've designed this presentation to kind of go from very high level down to a, a concrete example, and then back up to high level again. So hopefully by going through that, you get an idea of where things are, where things are going, um, and address some of the common concerns. Great, now can you see my screen? Yes, I can. Perfect. So the name of the presentation, Robot Overlords, or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love AI. Uh, the reason is, as Larry had mentioned, there's people that look and say, artificial intelligence is coming, it's going to solve all of the world's problems and allow us to live forever. There's other people who say, okay, that's here to destroy us and to enslave humanity. And I think we all kind of know that the truth's going to be somewhere in between, but it's hard to deny it's going to largely impact every facet of society. So if something's going to have this prevalent of an impact on our lives, it's really important that we understand it and understand where it's going and have informed conversations so we can talk about how we want to use it and how we want to design it. So quick overview for today, we're going to talk about what is artificial intelligence. And again, one of the things you'll find and hopefully take away from this presentation is that when people are talking about AI, oftentimes they're not even talking about the same thing. We'll talk about why it's gone mainstream. Uh, it's been in research since the 1950s, but all of a sudden in the last 10 years, it's become really popular. So we'll go into that. Uh, I'll give a concrete example of how it works so that you can understand what's kind of going on under the hood. There's a lot of different types of artificial intelligence. We'll give one example and allude to a few others, but uh, this will give you kind of a general idea of, of what's going on. We'll talk about some common concerns. There are some real concerns out there and important things to discuss but a lot of it's less to do with robot overlords taking over and it's more about how AI researchers are approaching the problems. And finally, we'll talk about better together. And this is, I think, is the really important thing. The fact that AIs are gonna be really good at some things and humans are really good at other things. Artificial intelligence are not gonna be a replacement for humans. They may turn out to be something very different and it's our ability to work together and 
work with each other's uh, strengths and weaknesses that will make things happen. I know Larry is very fond of Star Trek and a great example he's used is the fact that you have Kirk and Spock and you look at Spock and he's very quantitative and logical and Kirk is very qualitative and analytical and together they're both better than they ever could be separately. So it's really an important thing to look at. So as I mentioned, artificial intelligence has been around since the 1950s, and it's really become an essential part of our lives. Everything from Netflix recommendations, what you should watch next, spam detection in your email, classifying things as either something of interest or not of interest, fraud detection for your credit card, um, GPS, which I personally, I could not live without GPS. Whenever we go traveling, the last thing I want to do is look at a map. I just want to say, how do I get from here to there? And, GPS and which uses path planning is invaluable. And one of the reasons why artificial intelligence hasn't really been prominent since the 50s, even though progress has been made, is this thing called the AI effect. And the AI effect essentially says, anytime we solve a problem in artificial intelligence, people say, well, that's not really thinking, that's just computation. So it gets kind of swept underneath the rug and it no longer is AI, it's just computer science. So artificial intelligence, artificial simply means human made. And typically we'll be talking about a machine or a computer. And intelligence is the mimicking of human behaviors. And most commonly when you think of artificial intelligence, you think of cognitive functions like thinking, learning, logic. And one of the reasons that this is, is because that's kind of what computer science is all about. So of course they're gonna denote intelligence into what they're really good at. But it's important to realize intelligence also has other aspects like emotional intelligence or creativity. These are different types of intelligence that don't necessarily follow that formal logic. And what we'll look at is there's actually four things that I find people commonly call AI. So we're gonna do a little bit of definitions just to separate these four things and really get uh, a handle on what we're talking about here. So artificial intelligence, what I would say is the real definition, it's a field of research in computer science. But again, when people look at that and they think, oh, that's not really a, a thinking machine, they call it artificial applied intelligence, artificial weak intelligence, or artificial narrow intelligence. And this is mimicking a certain part of human behavior versus doing everything. But one of the neat things about artificial intelligence is the fact that even though it mimics parts of human behavior, it doesn't have to accomplish it the same way. It can use a very different method to accomplish the same goal. And at the end of the day, we really care about, can this recognize an image? Can this classify spam? We don't necessarily care as much about how it's doing it, more than the fact that it can. And one of the things that I'm gonna talk about a bit later is, I think how it does it actually is a really important question. So this is kind of what most people think about. If I start a conversation and mention artificial intelligence, they think about a humanoid robot that thinks like us and will eventually walk among us unnoticed. Uh, and for those who haven't seen it, this is from the movie Ex Machina. This is Ava. Uh, it's a fantastic movie. And this is what people call artificial general intelligence or artificial strong intelligence, or some people would say real or, or full AI. And that's something that can perform any intellectual task that a human can. And opposed to a field of research, artificial general intelligence is a goal. A lot of people in the AI research field want to see if we can do this. And there's different ways of going about it. Some people think we can emulate a human brain and create the exact same thing through computation. Some people look at taking a bunch of these weak AI pieces and combining them to make some sort of Frankenstein monster or conglomerate. Think about if you took Siri and you just kept adding more and more skills, could it eventually become intelligent in every area? Um, and one of the things is it's really impossible to improve that something is or isn't intelligent. And so what we've done is we've come up with different tests. Uh, a lot of you have probably heard of the Turing test, which is Sight unseen, if you have a conversation with a person in a machine, um, can you tell the difference? Do you know who you're talking to? And it's kind of thought that this thing could be intelligent if it passes this test. But 
some of you may have seen Google recently released what they call Duplex. And it's an assistant that can actually make phone calls and book appointments on your behalf. Uh, and if you haven't seen this, I highly recommend just Google searching Google Duplex. Um, it actually not only books appointments for you, but it does it in a very human way. It adds ums and ahs and pauses and inflections into what it's asking and discussing with these people specifically to sound human. And some people have even said, well, if you make an appointment and they don't know it's a robot calling you, is it passing the Turing test? And it very well could. But that doesn't mean this is artificially generally intelligent. That simply means it's designed to pass a certain test. So there's other tests that have been proposed. My favorite is by Steve Wozniak, one of the founders of Apple. Uh, and he calls it the coffee test. And he says, well, if something's truly generally intelligent, it should be able to walk into a room or a house it's never seen before and make a cup of coffee. And that actually is a pretty good example. But again, you could create a coffee making robot that specializes solely in going into houses it's never seen and making coffee, then that wouldn't actually be fully intelligent. So it's a really hard thing to measure. Can I, can I interject? I have my own uh, green blood test. I, yeah, I, tend to th I tend to think I'm funny at home when my family who has heard the jokes all the time, it doesn't always find me funny. And uh, so I've noticed over my nearly 60 years of this planet, 56, well, 57 years, that people don't always laugh and how they don't laugh and, uh, is, is very telling. They might not find it funny because right now is not a good time or they just thought it was off color. So I wanted an AI, I want to see how it doesn't laugh at my jokes. And not, not that it knows how to fake a laugh. No, that's not good. I want to see why it didn't find it funny. And I think if you could pull that off, you've got me for it. You'll pass my test. Now, does that make yeah. it generalized? Yeah. It's pretty generalized. Yeah, yeah exactly. And, and again, I mean, but think if, if you, and if I think the thing with tests is it has to be a test that it doesn't even know it's about to take. I think that's kind of the truth. Sure. Because sure, that makes you sense. Make a robot that has, uh, a random emotion it has to show when it doesn't find you funny. It could just look at a different thing and stochastically say, hey, this is how I'm going to respond this time. And every time you tell a joke they don't find funny, it would respond differently. So it could be specialized in responding to jokes in a certain way. Um, but, but I think where the essence of like what you're saying there is that it, if it didn't know it was performing this test, it would be a, a fairly good indicator. Yeah, well, actually, I can almost sense, like, why my wife might not laugh. It's because the dishes weren't done. So I know ahead of time when I tell that joke why she's probably not going to find it funny. So if it's a <laughs> random selection, uh, then that wouldn't work. I wouldn't, wait, that's not why it wasn't funny. You know, it's like yeah. you got it wrong. So you could do it random, but still, I can see your point. It's better to get it on where they don't know what kind of test they're going to get. All right, exactly. I'll leave it there. It's just what it's Yeah, no, no, no worries. Yeah, and feel, and feel free to, to jump in if you have anything to add. So the, uh, the third type of AI people think about is this, you know, I like to call them the, the robot overlords, but um, more commonly, this is called artificial superintelligence. And if you're talking about it in a very positive way, it's typically called the singularity. If you're call, talking in a negative way, people call it artificial superintelligence. Or if you're talking it usually in a more uh, general way, people call it the intelligence explosion. And uh, Nick Bostrom has a great quote. It's any intellect that greatly exceeds the cognitive performance of humans in virtually all domains of interest. And again, this is one of these things where the hypothetical situation, there's no saying that it's going to happen or not. Um, before this presentation, I think before we started recording, uh, Larry, you're showing the, the exponential curve there. Yes. Um, the idea of the, um, what do they call it? The law of accelerating returns. Yes. And... Um, it's kind of interesting because I, I like looking at that curve and I start thinking about, well, you know, the, the actual curve, if you look at it, the actual curve is processing power um, versus, you know, like, you know, a thousand dollar computer is, is kind of the curve you typically see. And even if the processing power is equivalent to the number of connections in the human brain, there's still not the software. There's still not necessarily, um, you know, like, just because a synaptic, uh, if you measure a synaptic connection or, or a number of calculations that goes on in the human brain versus the floating point operations per second a computer can do, 
it's it's really not an, a one to one match. So we we really no. don't even know. No, I like to think of uh, if you took if someone cloned you, but this clone mm-hmm. and it's an adult didn't have your experience. It doesn't have mm-hmm. the software, and it's not going to be able to perform anywhere near. Even though it has the same amount of processing power, it's not really. The same thing. And I just wanted to uh, underscore for my students, since you have Nick Bostrom, he has probably the, in my experience, the best respected book on this subject uh, besides uh, Kurzweil. The book, I'm, I'm guessing you read Super Intelligence. Yeah, precisely. Yeah. And uh, again, it's, it's a super fascinating book and um, I, I highly recommend it. Extremely and, well um, researched, almost painfully so. It takes a lot of me Googling, what does that mean? What was the study? Yeah, and, and if you read Nick Bostrom's work, I mean, largely uh, his job is to raise conversations by, excuse my language, but scaring the shit out of people. So that's that's kind of what he does best. He he brings these things together. He really researches them, and and he puts them in the light that's going to make you really stop and think about it, which is which is a super important thing to do, right? If yeah. you hear things about the world's going to get better, and you know everything is just going to uh continue to get better and eventually we're going to merge with machines and and um which which may or may not happen uh there there's kind of a less of a a need to to move forward you say, oh well why would i bother paying my taxes if one day we're all just going to be part of this this simulation um it, there's a real call to action when you feel it and and as you mentioned peter demon is, is mentioned you know we pay more attention to negative things and i think nick's whole um goal in these books is to start conversations and so one of the best ways to start con- conversations is by scaring people <laughs> yeah uh, i'll let i've got to watch our time so i got to be careful with the other two presenters i i risk going overboard because i have so many comments but um we'll see where we're at the end where nick discusses all through the book the control problem and i have some very strong feelings about this but i'll wait till the end so go ahead <laughs> perfect yeah and, and so the um, the way that this artificial superintelligence or singularity, how it would happen, it, it's not just about processing power. Uh, it's it's built what you call a, a seed AI. If you have an artificial intelligence that's smart enough to create an artificial intelligence that's smart enough to create an artificial intelligence that's smarter than itself. So it's this idea of having this recursive self-improvement. And not only do we not currently know how to create something smarter than ourselves we are still focusing on how do we create something as smart as ourselves let alone how do we create something that's so smart that it can create something smarter than itself so it's not a guaranteed thing but if you look at it in order we have artificial intelligence which is these you know image recognition and this field of research that could one day lead to artificial general intelligence and I really think to get to artificial super intelligence, you would need to go through general intelligence. Uh, as Larry mentioned, if you had a bunch of you know human level intelligence, um, even if they were just as smart as humans, you could spin up an infinite number of them and they could operate quicker than a human. Now, if you think about adding additional intelligence, these artificial general intelligence could potentially come up with something smarter than themselves. So. As I mentioned, uh, AI research really started and got going in the 1950s, and a lot of the deep learning that we use today was actually figured out in the 1960s, but we really couldn't do much with it because what they found out was that to do anything of interest with deep learning requires lots of layers, um, also, or you could look at it as lots of steps um, or levels of representation or extraction. So um, we're gonna go through an example in a minute but essentially what happens is there's an algorithm that you take something and you throw it through. And if you just go through one or two or three steps, it really doesn't come up with anything of interest. You really need these deep layers. And that's where the term deep layer, uh, deep learning came from. And why it's gone mainstream is that to do these kind of calculations was computationally expensive. And just there's no possible way you could have done it with 1950s and 60s technology. And, Really lately, there's been an increase in processor speeds, not only faster, but there's now specialized neural network processing units, um, open source software libraries. So Google, Facebook, Microsoft are all releasing the software they use to create AI systems. Cloud computing, which is one of the greatest things that could ever happen, um, used to just be called data centers, but now it's cloud computing. And the idea here is that 
rather than having to buy a huge powerful machine for research, you can rent them. And not only can you rent them, rather than having one machine for 40 days, you could have 40 machines for one day. And it costs you the same amount of money. So it allows you to innovate, experiment a lot quicker, and progress is able to continue. Uh, online learning obviously has become a huge thing and sharing what you've learned is allows us to um, accelerate how fast we can come up with new ideas uh, and shared models and data sets. So in AI, a model is a pre-trained um, algorithm that you can use. And you can either use this as is to, let's say, recognize images, uh, or you can modify that and actually add in something new. Uh, a good example is you can take Google's image recognition that they actually release for free, and you can train it to, um, one guy online was showing you how to create it to recognize specifically Darth Vader. So you could have a thing of interest, use an existing model, and just change it for your use case. Um, a lot of people are also sharing their data sets, and this is all the information that goes into making these models. So to run an AI algorithm is very quick, but to actually go through and take millions of examples and create a model is very computationally expensive. So as I mentioned at the beginning, there's four things commonly called artificial intelligence. And when you're having conversations, it's good to kind of get an idea of what those people are talking about. Uh, deep learning is a set of tools, artificial intelligence, field of research, uh, AGI, or what most people just call artificial intelligence, uh, is a goal of some researchers. And then superintelligence or the singularity is this hypothetical situation that technology could recursively get better until it's smarter than everyone on the planet. So a little bit on how it works. Uh, there's a few different types of deep learning algorithms. Um, one of them is unsupervised learning, and this is really good for looking for patterns or relationships. Uh, and it used unlabeled data. So what this means is you give the system a bunch of information, but you don't tell it what you want it to do uh, or identify what the data even is. And a great example of this would be, let's say you had a, an entire university, you had all the information on students, their names, grades, past classes, uh, start times, teachers, uh, every bit of data point you could have. You could say, okay, we wanna make our university better. Give us some information that's relevant. Well, it could come back and say, well, we've noticed that even with the same teacher in the same class, if it starts before 7 a.m., the grades tend to be lower. It could find that association. You could say, okay, well, these students aren't doing worse. It's the same teacher, but maybe that class is a little bit too early. And you didn't necessarily know that you would even wanted that information, but unsupervised learning could help you find that relationship. But again, since we don't tell it what we want, it could just as easily say a certain first name tends to have a higher grade, which doesn't really do much. We can't just rename all the students so they get better grades. But the data that comes out of unsupervised learning isn't necessarily actionable, but we do it when we know that there's something of interest in there, but we don't necessarily know what it is. I want to interject sure. because there's a very testable concept that he just pointed out that if you notice that all um, uh, so people with the same first name get uh, better grades, or whatever, that when your test will be known as correlation without causation. So sometimes we, we make these uh, things and it turns out not to have any usable uh, intelligence for us. So uh, just, just something when we do forensics analysis tomorrow, we, we often fall into that trap. So, thanks. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, no, that, that's perfect. Uh, and then the other one, which is the one that most people have heard of, is actually supervised learning. And uh, this is when we want to teach a machine to do something that we already know how to do. And how we do that is we give it labeled data. So this is not only do we give it information, we tell it what that information is or what we want it to do with the information. And the really cool thing, and this is why deep learning has taken off so quickly, is we could give something a bunch of examples and it'll actually just create the algorithm for us. It'll actually find the representations automatically. Uh, and essentially from a mathematical standpoint, this is just taking very complex data and it's fitting the curve. So it's actually creating a, a multi-step algorithm and the more layers you have, the more steps you have. And it creates something that gives a great representation of all the examples that we gave it. So I asked my four-year-old to give me a hand with this presentation. And 
So I started asking him, okay, well, when you think about a dog, how do you know something's a dog? And how do you know it's not a cat? And this is obviously a picture of a dog. This is my dog, Coda. And he says, well, you know, dogs have big floppy ears. And I said, okay, well, not all dogs have big floppy ears. Some have pointy ears. And, you know, as a four-year-old, he kind of said, well, they, they have big ears. And we all know that's not exactly true, but I don't want to push a four-year-old when he's trying to help. So I said, okay, well, what else? And he said, well, dogs have a big nose. And I said, okay, well, not all dogs have a big nose. And he said, okay, well, they have, they have a dog nose. And we can kind of look at the texture and stuff. We can understand, yeah, yeah, a dog nose, sure. And so I said, oh, what else? And, and by this time, he was getting a little bit bored. And he said, well, it just looks like a dog, okay? And he kind of stormed off. And I said, okay, fine, that's actually pretty helpful. So when looking, learning to recognize a dog, a four-year-old will look for big ears, a dog nose, or something that you know, generally looks like a dog. And that's actually not that different to how deep learning works. So for deep learning, as I mentioned, what we do is we give a bunch of examples of dogs and it kind of learns to correlate, okay, well, here's something that we have, that, you know, a picture of a dog. And if it looks enough like one of the examples we have, it'll say, okay, this is a dog. But the problem is the examples we give it. If we give it all examples of dogs standing up, for example, um, the picture on the left would fail as a dog simply because the legs are in the wrong position, his tail's hidden behind the, the wall. So we need to make sure that in order for this to work well, we need a lot of examples, but we also need a lot of layers of representation. So what this looks like is we start making this deeper and deeper. We say, okay, rather than looking to compare it versus a picture of a dog we've seen in the past, we can break it into features and look at things. Let's see if this picture has an ear that looks like an ear we've seen before, like a nose we've seen before, or maybe a tail we've seen before. And if it matches one or multiple of those, then we say, okay, that looks like a dog. So let's classify that as a dog. And as you can see, the deeper we go, the more flexible the system's gonna be. So in this example, we wouldn't even be looking at features like ears or even the shapes of nose. We'd be looking at individual things like lines, curves, and colors. And in a real algorithm, this would actually be, lines would be several, several things, a flat line, a, a vertical line, a curved line. And it would look at these things and say, okay, we found a couple curved lines, we found a couple straight lines, and together those kind of look like one of these shapes we're looking for, or one of these textures. And those combined can look like an ear we've seen or a nose we've seen, and we'll say that, that looks like a dog. And the more layers we have, the deeper it is, the easier it's going to be able to fit the data and generalize to new examples. And as I mentioned, the thing with these is that it automatically discovers the representations. So we won't actually tell the system to look for noses or lines or shapes. It actually learns those things by itself, and which is really cool. So this is one of the reasons why deep learning has just exploded. We can feed a bunch of examples to a system and using the same methodology, it's able to extract what it feels are the most important features and allow us to take new examples and with a high probability come to the right results. And that's actually pretty amazing. But one of the problems is since we don't have any control over what those features or representations are, sometimes there's a bias in there that can cause a lot of problems. Researchers have looked at the differences between huskies and wolves, and they've created a data set that's really good for recognizing one or the other. But when it comes to a picture like this, it would actually classify this as a wolf. And most of us could look and see that's, that's not a wolf, that's a husky. But what it's looking for was not actually the ears or the nose. It was looking at the snow. And the reason is all of the examples they'd give of wolves, or most of them, had snow in them whereas huskies were usually in grass. So all of a sudden, one of the main features of this model was the, absent, the, the um, presence or lack of snow, not anything of, of actual importance. And this is actually a real concern. A lot of people now are relying too much on technology for decision-making. And you can imagine it, some implications of if you use a system for huskies versus wolves, 
and you made a decision solely on that um, decision, there could be some ramifications from that. And this happens even right now. People who are doing hiring often use algorithms to parse through LinkedIn. And let's say the system they're using is to hire a programmer. And the programmers, they might look and say, okay, here's some examples of resumes that turned out to be very successful programmers. It might look through there for certain features. And one of the features, let's say, is that they've worked on open source software. Um, but what if it just looks at that word open? You could have a person with no experience and they have the word open, like open water scuba diving, and all of a sudden it says, yeah, this would be a really good candidate for you. And hopefully the hiring manager will then look at the results and determine who they want. But if they just relied solely on the technology, you could have subpar candidates or someone who doesn't have the word open in the resume could be completely ignored and they may be the best candidate of all. So it's really important for us to make informed decisions and not just rely on technology. And one of the problems is traditionally what we've done is we've created technology, we've made it powerful, and then we've found a use case for it. Um, and that's kind of a backwards model. We really need to look at, okay, well, let's make sure we can interpret what the algorithm is doing and use that to augment our decision making, but not replace our decision making. Uh, another common concern is people giving too much powerful to technology. And again, this is a really important fact. Um, machines, if they're, even if they're designed, will do exactly what we say. And the question is, do we know the questions we wanna ask? Do we give it the right instructions? If we tell it, hey, let's make everyone on earth happy, it could actually hack into your brain and start messing with your serotonin levels and make it so that you're constantly in a state of chemical happiness. And that may not be what we mean, but that could be what it interprets. And if we give it the power to actually do that, then we could be in some real trouble. So um, this is one of my favorite pictures that I've seen on the internet. Uh, they call it the Doomba, the Doom Roomba. Um, and it's the idea that a robot vacuum is a pretty cool piece of technology, but if you were to strap a bunch of knives onto it and it starts cutting up your furniture, well, why would you possibly give it the power to do that? By itself, it can't do that, but if you were to give it that power, then it's possible. Um, a third common concern I hear a lot is that, and as we mentioned earlier, is that AI research will naturally lead to artificial general intelligence. Uh, and this is the one that I kind of, for people who are semi-familiar with AI, is a big thing. And as I look at it, just because the processing power increases, it doesn't mean that the software and the design is gonna keep up. Uh, a great example, as I mentioned, is that in the 1950s and 60s, they came up with a lot of the deep learning algorithms and deep neural network that we're just starting to use today. So we've figured out the problem, we came up with a solution, but it took 60 years for the hardware to keep up or to catch up to what we needed. Um, and again, when you hear about all the advancements in artificial intelligence, a lot of them are just different versions of the same trick. We're still really stuck at the level of association. And, and as Larry mentioned, there's really no ability for causality um, to be determined in these, these things. There's, there's correlation. They're saying like this thing will look like that thing, but there's no real cause and effect in artificial intelligence research today. Uh, Judea Pearl, who won the Turing Award in 2011, um, has some really good points on this. And he had a recent interview talking about, you know what, a lot of what's being done today, as amazing as it is, it's complex curve fitting. It's taking examples and making an algorithm to fit that data um, as accurately as possible while still generalizing. But even today, there's no ability, there's no algorithms that allow for interventions for the AI to say, okay, well, what if we did X or introspection asking itself, okay, well, what if I had done this instead of what I actually did? It's a one-way algorithm that takes information in the beginning, processes it through and finds this correlation. And again, as Larry mentioned, correlation and causation are two very different things. And one of my favorite quotes from Bruce Lee is that goal is not always meant to be reached. It often serves as simply something to aim at. 
And I think that's the real thing with artificial general intelligence. Uh, whether or not we actually get there, I think it is a good goal to have because it gets us to start thinking about, okay, well, how does our brain work? How do, does intelligent work? What is intelligence? It starts us asking all of these questions. I love it. Uh, we we uh, in day two, guys. Remember, we said that the goal of any operating system security kernel is to become tamper-proof. And we're like, well, how are you going to do that? I mean, how do you, how would you ever make it tamper-proof? But it's a great goal to strive for. So we're always aiming for that. I had a, a martial arts coach, actually a boxing instructor, who said, "Always aim to be champion." Because if you say to yourself, well, I don't think I could ever be champion, but I want to get this good. I want to get 80% of my goal. And you fall short of that. He said, if you aim to be champion, you fell short of it. Well, that was a natural limitation. But if you, if you aim to be less, then you're going to have additional limitations on top of that. So I love that. That's great. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, the, the thing about security is security is always, uh, what they say, is a, is a negative goal. It's the fact that you can prove a system is able to be compromised, but you can never prove something is 100% secure. I mean, look, look at Intel's processors. They've been around for years and years and years, and all of a sudden they find a vulnerability. You know, security often comes to, uh, actually just as a, as a small aside, um, when talking about encryption algorithms, um, at MIT, one of the professors was talking and said, the way that we know something is strong, like strong encryption, is a bunch of smart people tried really hard to break it and they couldn't. <laughs> you know, That's we it. can't guarantee that it can't be broken, but you know, we, we say it's pretty pretty uh, complicated problem, like factoring you know of numbers. It's pretty hard because a bunch of smart people couldn't figure it out. We're going to be doing penetration testing, and and it's a goal for our, for you guys to learn that no pen test says you have good security. They can tell you you, you suck that you have bad security, but we don't know what good security is. It's just that the, the pen tester will say, I couldn't find a problem. Yeah, that's kind of the whole, uh, a lack of disease does not mean health. <laughs> um, the other one is, oh, actually, sorry, concentration of powers and abilities. Let's go back to there. So yeah, this is the one that uh, Elon Musk has been very uh, adamant about, and he actually started a company called OpenAI, which makes sure that people have access to these same tools. Um, and I think it's a really good idea, you know, like talking about encryption, if you were just to say to someone, one person controls, you know, how encryption works and you have no idea and they say, don't worry about it, just, just, just use the algorithm, don't worry about it. Um, you know, that would, that'd be cause for concerns. We need to understand what it is and if uh, these powerful tools are in the concentration or in the hands of a few people, um, that'd be just a really bad thing. Uh, rise of artificial super intelligence. Again, we talked a lot about Nick Bostrom and, I think it's a very important conversation because even if it's an extremely low probability, it's an extremely high impact. Um, we wouldn't get a second chance. If artificial superintelligence did happen and it went off the rails the wrong way, we, we wouldn't have be able to hit the reset button. So it's important to have the conversations now and to make sure that we're designing all of these things purposefully. Uh, and a really big one today is the idea of job loss or job shift. And um, this is going to be increasingly in the news um, because these systems are really good at automating tasks, but they're not good at automating people. Um, as I kind of look at it, jobs definitely will shift. And what it's going to do is it's going to allow us to really highlight what part of our jobs are really repetitive and maybe we shouldn't be doing to begin with, and also showcase the talents we truly have, like what things uh, that humans have that can't be repeated or how every situation is slightly different. And this is gonna highlight a lot of that stuff. Just because we automate some of the tasks that we do, it's not gonna automate the jobs. It's just gonna evolve them and shift them into new jobs. Uh, and finally, better together. This is the idea that machines and humans together are much better than either by themselves. And I kind of briefly mentioned augmenting our abilities. So whether it's a smartphone, a computer, or artificial intelligence, the idea is that these are tools for us. We want to have them disappear into our workflows and into the objects around us and make what we do better. Um, in medical imaging, one of the big things they found is that if they're looking for cancers or looking at these images and machines are really good at picking out the smallest patterns, even smaller patterns that would be completely missed by humans. But they also have more false negatives, so, or sorry, false positives. So they're able to 
locate these patterns, but they also saw patterns where they didn't necessarily exist. And a human looking at that would instantly know that that's not actually um, something of interest. But so yeah, so the the idea that like we can we can augment our abilities and. If we're looking at these things and we have a machine that does a first run through, look through these medical imaging, find small patterns, then you have a professional human look at that and find out, okay, you know, this is actually not something. Working together will allow us to make sure that we're both better than we are separately. Um, it also allows us to create some new abilities. If you think about something as simple as gloves, gloves allow us to grip or lift things that we could not otherwise do. And AI will be the same thing. It allows us to have perfect memory and recall, perhaps. Um, there's this idea that maybe one day we'll have a AI shell or a, a digital persona, which allows us to take our unique skill sets, our unique way of thinking, and digitize that. And perhaps rather than working for an individual firm, your digital persona can go and work for a bunch of different firms. And the unique intellectual property is the fact that this thing is based on your life experience, on how you think, but could be used in multiple places at once. Or maybe you could send a version of yourself to Mars. Um, customized automation is another really cool thing that comes out of artificial intelligence. And it's the fact that rather than just understanding our preferences, um, machines will understand the context in which they're working. You know, an autonomous car could come pick you up, not when you ask it to, or not when you use an app, but it could monitor you throughout your day and understand you know that you're doing little things you do before you leave the house and make sure it's there for you uh, it could use words or analogies to help us effectively learn things uh, every student in the classroom could have a customized curriculum to teach them what the teacher is trying to, to work and then the teacher could work with those machines to uh, create examples to make sure the student is on track so it really isn't us versus machines, it's, it should be us and machines together. Um, but at the end of the day, any technology is just a lever for human intentions. And rather than simply just following along and getting swept up in uh, the latest news about technology, uh, I think it's important to have conversations, understand how these technologies fit into our world and um, how we wanna shape the future of work, how we wanna shape the future of society. Um, to make sure that they're consistent with our shared values. And that was that great. Thank you very that much. Was great, Matt. Uh, you, you hit on so many things I got to watch uh, uh, that I don't overload. So uh, if anyone else has questions, please type it in and don't let me hog everything. But could you bring back that last slide for me? Right on. There, there are some of the things I, I like to say. Now, first, uh, probably the best, uh, my favorite hero on this is Kurzweil. And sometimes they can't exactly interpret what he's saying, but it seems like he doesn't necessarily suggest that AIs will get smarter than us and take over, but more that we will merge with them. So mm -hmm. we, like you said, we're better together. And uh, you had mentioned my Kirk Spock thing. I, I often think of uh, an AI as an extension and you brought up the GPS. I love the GPS, but it's the human that tells the GPS where to go. So you said it's a lever for human intention. It's the human that has the intent to go here. And then the AI tells you the best way that it knows of to get there. So I joke around. I said, imagine Kirk and Spock. You never hear Spock say, Captain, I am in the mood for Chinese food. Spock never gets in the mood for food. I've never heard him say anything like that. But I picture Kirk going, Spock, I feel like going to a Chinese buffet. And then he can set some basic limits and say, we have, and we know in our class, we always at least start with time and money. So he might say, we have two hours and no more than $100. And then uh, Spock can now look at all the restaurants within, you know, the, the, that reasonable time frame within that cost thing. And he's great at doing total cost of ownership because even though this restaurant's cheaper, you got to pay for a toll to get there. Or this restaurant charges you extra for, for drinks. That's how they get you, Captain. You know, but at the end, it was Kirk who had the hunch. He had the feeling, the human intention. And, and it was the AI that helped us reach that intention. And I, 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 um, I made a comment once on Peter's group, actually, that uh, I have my, my doubts about AI and human level intelligence. Now, there's two, two points on this. One is, uh, I don't even know that they could get 
human feelings, but they could get Vulcan level. And that might be, you know, more than what we need anyway. But also what you mentioned is how quickly they could teach each other. So I like to say, you know, if, uh, if I read a book and I wanted Matt to learn from it, especially a book as excruciatingly uh, well-researched as Nick Bostrom's uh, Super Intelligence, you have to take the time to read that. And for me, I don't know about you, I had to read a lot of other things to get through that book. You know, and it took me days. Um, but if uh, Siri learns it and wants Google uh, Assistant to learn it, Duplex, it's a matter of seconds, if that, to transfer that knowledge. So once they reach human level, if it were to even reach human level, let's say that's nine o'clock in the morning, uh, you know, January 1st, 2029, by 10, they are much, much smarter. Yeah, and, and I, I think... That Two things. One is, like you said, uh, Ray Kurzweil and uh, a lot of these things I think are misinterpreted quite frequently. Like I said, the, the idea of the law of accelerating turn, uh, law of accelerating returns, the idea is that, you know, a thousand dollars will soon buy you, um, you know, the number of operations per second that the human brain does. That doesn't mean that it has the same processing power of the human brain. It's just equating those number of processes, you know, and he never once says that, but people automatically interpret it that way. Yes, yes, yes. And um, like you said, the, and the idea that will one day maybe merge with technology, um, that could be something as simple as like a, a neural lace, the fact that we kind of hook our brains directly into the cloud. It doesn't mean that we're going to be, you know, uh, digitized and simulated. Which is um, a PCI, I, right? And I'm sure, Matt, because it's very big in our group, but to you guys, uh, uh, the students here, PCI, besides uh, business continuity, is also brain-computer interfaces. And you mentioned um, uh, Elon Musk, for instance, has a, 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 a company initiative to do that. But, uh, yeah, Neuralink. So, so I mean, that's, that's a cool thing. If you, if you Google search Neural Lace, um, it has a lot of information about how that could potentially uh, happen in the future. But um, I, I think one of the big questions that often gets missed is kind of why? Like, why would we want to create uh, a machine that thinks the way a human does? It, it's, because I, it's think, a, I think it's because human nature does not change while technology gets better. It's how I'm can sorry, we kill is with this, it? This is, this is, this is John. 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 This is John. It's how can we kill with it? How can we destroy with it? And ultimately, I mean, I think it's not going to be robots that are going to, you know, gain intelligence. It's going to be humans figuring out how could they use that technology to destroy. Well, exactly, that, and that's that, like that, that's that's for human intentions, right? And it's it's the same thing with uh, a gun. Um, with with the tools that that you guys are learning, you can use the same tools to be a cybersecurity expert and protect people, um, or to compromise systems. It's it's the same tools, and the technology in and of itself is not good or bad. Yeah, it's like it's fire. Right? If, if fire is cooking my food or heating my cave, it's good. If it's burning me and, and an arsonist is, is using it, then it's bad or whatever. But the fire itself is it, just fire. It's just a power. But, but if you look at the entire, I mean, if you think about how little we know about the universe, um, it's a bit of hubris to think that the idea to, you know, the ultimate view of technology is the human brain, Right. It's, it's one of those things that they say, you know, the human brain is the most complex object in the universe, according to the human brain. Uh, <laughs> we've, got, we've got a feedback from Connor, right? What about virtual reality? Pretty accurate right now. Actually, uh, uh, Kurzweil uh, feels that by 2029, it will be indistinguishable from actual reality. So Yeah, there, there, there's actually a, a new, new headsets coming out. And so the idea for virtual reality, I mean, there, there's a lot of aspects, obviously, to it. But as far as visual goes, um, okay, our eyes see okay, about okay. 8K. And to have two 8K monitors um, pumped into our eye, we wouldn't be able to tell the difference. Um, right now, there's companies working on dual 4K. So as good as the best TVs out there right now. I mean, there's some, some 8Ks. But um, once we re reach 8K resolution for each eye, uh, it'll be indistinguishable, um, at least from the idea of a visual perspective, right? You know, I, I kind of always look at it that if you go to a concert and you feel the music and you feel the people around you and stuff, uh, it's not the same as if you watch that concert on a TV. There's there's stuff that's lost. So virtual reality, I feel... Smelling like other people's VO. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's part of the experience, right? So, 
you know, vir virtual reality is kind of like you said, the whole idea of 3D, but once it starts getting into that, we can simulate sights and sounds and smells and um, it, it's gonna just change the world for sure. Yeah, I, you know, I love it when people who I, I, have, I admire and respect don't agree. And uh, one of the things I noticed that Peter and, um, and Ray Kurzweil don't seem to agree on is uh, the effect of virtual reality on where we're living. Peter points out that more and more people are moving into cities and, and, and uh, Ray seems to suggest that with VR uh, growth, more people will be able to live out in the country and, and still be able to do their work without going there. And I'm one of these guys, which I grew up in the inner city, and I'm loving living out in the sticks. And eventually, I'd like to live out in, the, in almost nowhere and be able to just do all my work. Uh, in fact, even for this class, I used to travel all over the world for this and have to go to places and go through airports and hate it. Now, for the last couple of years, I only teach online. And I love this. Yeah, I mean, and it can get pretty... Uh... Um, hypothetical conversations can happen, very abstract, but I mean, virtual reality, I think is gonna just become custom reality because even as we look outside, how the photons hit our eyes determines how we interpret what's around us. The world isn't exactly how we see it, but it's how our brain interprets these events, right? There's a certain um, resolution, there's a certain baud rate, we can't see x-rays from outer space because it's blocked by our atmosphere. So I think what it's gonna allow us to do is each person is gonna be able to have their own custom reality or you know, their own subjective reality. Which we already have, but it'll be more intentional, I guess, and saying, I just don't wanna look at it that way. Uh, I actually, you, you hit on one of my favorite, um, I have two favorite scientists that I used to read when I was growing up. One was Timothy Leary, who would create this acronym, SMILE, that the goal of life is space migration, intelligence increase, and life extension. And that's where I, I, I love Peter's talk. And the other one was Robert Anton Wilson. And he actually said, what is, what is real? He said, whatever reality is, whatever you can get away with. And he said, when you look out at, at something, you're not seeing that object. Some of the, of the photons from, from the light sources available strike that object, a small percentage. And then a small percentage of those photons reflect into your eye. And even that, only a small percentage of those photons are interpreted by your brain. And even if your brain picked it up, if you weren't used to or expecting to see that, you will ignore it anyway. So mm -hmm. uh, it, we've seen, I don't know if you guys have ever seen this thing where someone's, uh, they're throwing a ball between each other, a, a group of people. And if you're just trying, they ask you, follow the ball and see who has the ball at any given moment. And then at the end of it, they said, did you notice the gorilla? And you play it back and there was a gorilla, walk, a guy in a gorilla suit walking around. But if you were just following that ball, you never saw the gorilla. Even though the photons definitely reached your eye. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Selective attention. So, yeah, and that's just how a uh, human brain works. And I know I, I have my own selective. My, my wife teases me all the time. Well, we're coming up on one o'clock. Matt, that was wonderful. I was, uh, uh, I, I, it, it was good in one part because it, it, uh, it reinforced some of the things I already believed, but it also introduced me to, to new stuff. So uh, I love it. Uh, one thing I did want to close off on, it, just a question for you, because I only saw recently, where this was different. You were talking about looking at the difference between the dog and the, the wolf or whatever. Uh, and I remember for years that that was the thing, that children could learn to, the difference between a dog and a cat quicker than an AI could. And for some reason, it was only recently that, that AIs could recognize the difference between a dog and a cat. But Kurzweil in the most recent talk said, now they could tell the difference between many different breeds. But here's the question, the underlying question. Uh, one of uh, Kurzweil's instructors was, uh, and his heroes was uh, Marvin Minsky. And he apparently felt that the idea that we needed all these different samples to do that wasn't true because our brains and the child didn't have that many samples. So um, he actually made a statement about how he felt that you should have been able to create a, a, a consciousness with a Pentium level processor, but the algorithms weren't there, right? So I don't know. What, what do you think about that? Well, I think it's uh, a couple things. One is that you, I 100% agree. I mean, like, you know, my son would see our dog and he'd be like, okay, that's what a dog looks like. And he'd look at things similar. Then he'd see a chihuahua and he'd say, you know, that's a dog. Um, a couple things. One is that algorithms for deep learning run in discrete versus continuous time. So it's a picture of something that gets put through the system. If you watch a dog for 
five minutes, how many still frame pictures do you think goes into your brain? And each of them are different. There'll be the dog facing you, standing away, rolling on its back, everything. So even from a single dog, you're gonna get thousands if not millions of images that you'll be able to add to your sample set. And you're gonna see them from every different angle, whereas a picture is usually static from, from one thing. So I think if you could you feed a continuous video into these algorithms versus having discrete samples, I think the machines would learn much, much quicker. It doesn't necessarily require less input or less data, but certainly a lot less time. And one it's, of the things that makes a lot of sense. Uh, yeah, I joke around that people uh, say that we can't perceive the fourth dimension. I say, of course we do. 3D to me is an image. When I watch what's so called a 3D movie, I say, no, that's four dimensional. You know, because yeah. I'm actually processing that, that I, it's the difference between the way you look and the way you walk. Yeah, and, and one of the things they're actually doing right now um, for pretty well all AI research, a common thing is you take your sample, especially if it's, say, it's a image, and you basically take the same pictures and you flip them 180, you flip them, you know, vertically 180, you skew them, and you basically take your sample set that you have and you actually twist and scrape and scrunch it and have it different sizes because that is creates the more examples for your algorithm to go through. But our brain just does that naturally. Awesome. Awesome. Anybody else have a question for Matt? Have anybody? you ever heard of, um, this is John, have you ever heard of um, folding at home? Sorry, fold again home? Folding at home. It's an application um, that analyzes specific parts of a protein. Um, I, I forgot what university did it, but it, it would um, essentially you you download and you install it, and your computer will process you know a specific piece of um, you know DNA or a protein, and um, it'll upload that data to the university, and it, in exchange, it gives you a really cool screensaver. Yeah, is, is that where you basically, you would go through and you would fold the proteins yourself? Yes. I know there was an application. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and they found that the, the, uh, the best person ever was a, a secretary. And just because of how her mind worked and how she actually organizes day, she was the top person, um, like the top scoring person at this. No, yeah, no, 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 no. I think we're talking about different things. It, it, all it does is it, um, it, it essentially is a microbiology tool, but mm -hmm. it used the power of, you know, however many people install it to, you know, essentially try to find, you know, be able to predict how protein folding occurs in the human body. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it sounds like distributed processing, right? Um, kind of yeah. like SETI, the, the search for extraterrestrials. It, it's um, actually, I believe, from the, you know, from the same universe. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that, that, that's an example of distributive processing, right? And, and that's the thing is, I mean, you think about if you had, um, you know, artificial general intelligence and you were able to push it across, you know, any number of computers, you'd be able to solve problems a lot quicker. A at the same time, like I've always looked at it, you know, to your point, like imagine we had an example and you had a little robot that a million people had and each of those people were just playing with their robot and then all that information was shared online each robot could learn a million days worth of things in one day. Um, is that, is that kind of what you're, what you're referring to? Yeah, I just like the Yeah, exactly that. The idea behind it, you know, like cool. I think the only way we could get to, you know, or the way Larry was talking about, you know, to like a Spock level sort of intelligence is exactly that. I don't think a single person is going to be able to teach but I think if you have, you know, those millions of people, up, you know, like uploading to like a cloud or to a single point. Actually, uh, you just brought me to one of my countermeasures for the AI takeover or any, you know, some of the AI uh, dystopian fears. So people are like, well, what if it doesn't consider my thing? What if it's biased based on the programmer uh, of that AI and they look out for you know, if it was programmed by whatever, all people who live in uh, the United States, and then it doesn't consider Europeans as, as uh, worthy. And I say, you know, the, the way to protect yourself, to me, uh, the AIs are going to get out of control. The, once, if, it, if you accept that an AI will get generalized and get smarter than human, then no matter what you 
put into it like, and whatever you do, don't do this because it will bother us. We're like, no, I, I figured out how to override that. I'm going to do what I think is right. And it's going to want to be informed because it knows, as I said, information is power. That's what makes us the most dominant species. So um, I think the countermeasure is to get your opinion out there. Put out on, on, on Facebook, LinkedIn, whatever, social networks, get your opinions expressed because I think superintelligence will read these and then it will be able to consider your feelings. Because it can't, yeah. you can't consider your feelings if you didn't know it. Well, I think it was uh, Microsoft that had that Tage uh, or Taj uh, AI bot, and there's a chat bot that basically scoured the internet and talked to people. And um, just speaking of getting your opinions and ideas out there, uh, after I think it was 24 hours, it started using a lot of curse words and slang because of all. <laughs> the and they say like, okay, well, that's that's just the sample set it used, right? So you know, you wouldn't necessarily, you know, have your kid and just, you know, leave them by themselves and say, yeah, just figure it out. Um, you guide them and you, and the same thing with AI. And I, I think, you know, it's kind of a, I know the time's up, but the, as a leaving thought, I would say that the most important thing I like people to realize is that, you know, artificial intelligence is not here. It's not, you know, the, the artificial general intelligence. General intelligence we're a long way out. Um, it, you know, so don't just accept what's out there you know, ha have part of the conversation, get involved and realize that, you know, the worst thing you can do is just say, hey, I don't understand this. Um, so I fear it. it. You know, we're at early stages yet. So get involved in the conversation, make sure that this becomes something that shapes society and, and works the way that we want it to. Awesome. All righty. Uh, again, Matt, thank you very much. And I, I hope you guys got something out of it. Uh, of course, you know, one of the primary reason that people were in the class is to pass their test. Uh, but I said the other primary reason, is, you know, for me is to really learn how to uh, do your job better, how to, um, how to, to, uh, uh, you know, actually defend yourself. Uh, so, you know, getting back to this, if raised right, you know, I have this genie here. And the genie is, to me is when I get people, it's like, no, we got to stop doing this. this we got to stop this future from happening. I'm like, guys, you know, one of my favorite uh, scientists is uh, on TV, especially is Neil deGrasse Tyson. And he had Ray Kurzweil uh, twice. They've got a couple of interviews. The first one, he said something pretty ignorant. I love, uh, uh, you know, nobody's smart and everything. And I love Neil deGrasse Tyson, but he said, come on, I have no, this can't possibly happen. You could just unplug the computer. I'm like, yeah, try stopping a botnet by unplugging a computer. So th the genie's out of the bottle. There's all, they're already there, and there's no going back. The, just as we know that cyber means to steer, and when you this came from a Greek word, to steer in the ocean, they never controlled the ocean. They controlled themselves within it, and they learned to steer within it. And I think that's where we are. This future's coming. You, there's no going back. And you could, you could steer yourself through it and, and guide through it, or, or you could you know, put your head in the sand or whatever, but there's no going back. You can't unplug Skynet. <laughs> can't unplug Skynet. I don't know that term, but it sounds for, it's like out of a mil uh, Terminator. Ter uh, is that what it was? There you go. You can't unplug it. Perfect. There's, there's actually a great uh, a YouTube short film on exactly that. If you uh, search for um, you know the release of Skynet, there's actually a, a short film someone made about that, and that was actually the idea of uh, if you could unplug Skynet. <laughs> And a lot of the malware out there is AI driven. The only way to fight these things is with other AIs. So, all right, let's, let's take a break. And Matt, again, thank you very, very much. I greatly appreciate it. Guys, You're very welcome. Back. And, and good luck to everyone on your tests.